After a negative advisory committee vote in June, the US FDA has now rejected the approval of MDMA-assisted therapy to treat PTSD. This is a heavy blow to the psychedelic renaissance in drug development, but is it justified? Tough luck? Or simply the evil boogeyman? Honestly, it is a bit of a clown show, but for none of the reasons you would expect. Let's look at some of the context and reasons behind this decision. In a previous video, we've explained the history, chemistry and synthesis of MDMA and looked at some of the clinical data. You might remember that it was much closer to approval than other psychedelics like psilocybin, ibogaine or DMT, which are currently in many clinical trials as well. In phase 3, MDMA-assisted therapy significantly decreased indicators of PTSD severity and depression compared to placebo. Also, tolerability and safety seemed very encouraging. So why was the approval decision anything but trivial? Let's first address a common topic of debate. Some argue that regardless of the strength of evidence, the quote-unquote system would be against the approval of MDMA anyways. Well, the FDA granted MDMA and other psychedelic compounds so-called breakthrough therapy designations already. This mechanism helps to accelerate development and review of selected therapies with promising early evidence in conditions with high unmet need. This makes sense given PTSD affects 13 million people in the US alone, causing tremendous patient health and economic burden. This designation is not earth-shattering or binding, but it's quite obvious that if regulators would have some categorically negative stance, they wouldn't bother with using resources to support these drugs. Unless you maybe think that is part of the plan. Others imply that regulators act to protect interests of evil big pharma by reducing competition. This would require other approved PTSD drugs to be cash cows. Well, the FDA only approved two of them more than two decades ago. This means branded drugs are already way past patent exclusivity and already face cheaper generic competition. For example, Paroxetine saw yearly branded sales erode from $3 billion in 2002 to just $150 million in 2003 across all indications, of which PTSD is just one. Branded Sertraline has slightly higher revenue, but both of them are peanuts. If any company would want to create a collusion, they would not do it for such tail-end products. Actually, approval of psychedelic compounds in this case might be favorable to Big Pharma. They can develop new mechanisms or outright acquire smaller companies that offer differentiated treatments, allowing them to command higher prices for the innovation over available generics. The FDA also regularly rejects applications of companies and is not particularly lenient towards specific or larger players. We've mentioned in another video on the value of newly approved drugs that many of them do not bring incremental medical benefit compared to existing treatments. This actually suggests the FDA significantly increases optionality and thus indirectly competition rather than allegedly supporting monopolies. However, there's also some valid criticism. There might be conflicts of interest arising from federal employees leaving to join industry companies or due to the fact that almost half of the agency's total budget comes from so-called user fees paid by industry companies. This shares some of the financial burden with those who profit from approvals but could also create blind spots and make the agency not as tough and decisive as it should be. Back to MDMA. Why was the rejection not a shocker for many? Well, an independent advisory committee already voted against its use based on current data back in June 2024. These committee members are unaffiliated with the agency and most of them are medical and scientific experts. The advice is not binding, but as we can see, it tends to be followed. A recent data set shows that overall 88% of decisions are aligned. It gets more interesting if we differentiate positive versus negative ADCOM votes. 97% of cases with positive votes for initial approvals also saw FDA approval. However, only 67% of cases with negative votes also saw non-approval. This actually suggests that FDA is rather on the side of approving drugs in contrast to the claim that it would seek to limit approvals. The 67% figure should be treated with some caution though because many of these negatively voted drugs were approved only years after the vote, at which point new evidence may have emerged to support a quote-unquote overruling of the ADCOM. 
However, the FDA usually declined to reconvene advisors prior to the decision, so committees voting against it often couldn't advise on any new data. This research also highlighted that the FDA convened committees less frequently over the last decade, dropping from a high of 50 in 2012 to a low of 18 in 2020 and 21. Because MDMA was a negative ADCOM vote, it was thus less clear whether the FDA would align with it or not. It turned out it did, requesting an additional phase 3 trial to further study the safety and efficacy of MDMA. But why? Let's try to understand some of the arguments that are out there on a high level. This non-exhaustive commentary does not reflect the position or logic of the ADCOM or the FDA itself, nor is it medical advice. It's quite text heavy, so you should pause or read through the various public materials yourself if you're interested. So the first issue was to be expected and impacts all drugs with psychoactive effects to some degree. Because MDMA administration is noticeable, placebo-controlled clinical trials are almost impossible to be blinded. A post-study survey revealed that most patients were able to correctly guess their assignment, a staggering 90% for patients on drug and 75% for patients on placebo. This so-called functional unblinding creates significant bias. Patients who know they get active treatment expect they would experience a benefit, and vice versa for placebo patients who expected a lack thereof. Because the patient's behavior would be markedly different, the study staff was likely also aware of all the assignments, removing both sides of the blinding. The company reasonably argued that the FDA had agreed on the proposed phase 3 trial design back in 2017 already, and that there were some steps taken to mitigate the impact. Obviously, it's impossible for any psychedelic drug to avoid unblinding, but some argue 90% is so high that it almost makes the placebo control a bit pointless. A more unique challenge is expectation bias. Given 40 to 50% of participants had used MDMA at least once prior, with some having up to 10 prior uses. The logic is that participants might enroll in the study because they had a good previous experience and believe it's going to work. This self-selection bias can enrich the trial to show false positive efficacy. This was likely significant given the very low dropout rate in this complex program consisting of 19 visits, suggesting that participants had a very high level of interest, engagement and perhaps even allegiance. There was limited information on trial recruitment itself and much of it came through referrals, which could again drive selection biases. The company argued that prior MDMA use did not lead to different outcomes, but they did not actually assess the patient's expectancy, so this remained a point of debate. They also conducted a follow-up at least six months after, which might help assess whether it was indeed MDMA driving the results. This monitoring showed durable benefit on the CAPS-5 efficacy endpoint, which captures key symptoms of PTSD and the improvement even increased versus placebo over time. However, the ADCOM noted the interpretability is challenged due to the high dropout between the trials, non-standardized follow-up durations and intercurrent use of other treatments by some patients. This introduced many confounding variables which could skew results significantly. Given durability was assessed only once, it's hard to say how robust the data is because symptoms of PTSD can fluctuate significantly. The phase 3 sample size seems rather small for a condition that impacts 13 million people and other psychiatry trials usually have few hundred patients or more. Actually, this was fine here because the efficacy benefit was expected to be very large. However, as we start to add all of these complexities that muddy the picture, the small sample size becomes a clear issue. Moreover, reports noted in the draft evidence assessment by the ICER Institute hint at the CAPS-5 measure potentially failing to capture real response. They suggest that some participants improved on the score superficially while worsening due to new issues becoming overwhelming after MDMA-assisted therapy. Other points relate to the psychotherapeutic sessions. On the positive side, they required dual treatment by two therapists, but just one of them had to be licensed. The sessions themselves were not deemed sufficiently structured or standardized. They were described as relatively vague and ill-defined interventions that could not have been the same across therapists and the two study arms, adding more variability. A more debated point was whether it would have made sense to investigate a 2x2 design with psychotherapy and MDMA alone, respectively. What benefit really comes from the drug versus the therapy? 
There was one alarming incident where a participant experienced significant misconduct and even assault by a therapist. MDMA can enhance suggestibility, meaning therapists can significantly influence participants. This wouldn't just falsify data in the trial, but could also expose patients to manipulation in the real-world setting. Keep in mind that clinical trials are as controlled as the intervention will ever be, so all of these issues would be amplified after approval. For example, you could envision that commercial operations might pay less attention to rigorous controls and quality of staff to maximize profits. Others have also called the psychotherapeutic approach and content into question. This ranges from debatably high degree of touch permissible by the therapist to some disputed frameworks. Therapists are also allegedly highly supportive of MDMA-assisted therapy, which challenges an objective clinical trial on top of the unblinding and suggestibility that we've seen. Many of these open questions and confounding variables related to efficacy also impact safety. For example, a high share of previous MDMA users likely makes safety data look better than it is. But are there any unique considerations on this side of the equation? The safety database included a total of 476 patients. This is smaller than you would expect for a highly prevalent condition, but because PTSD is a life-threatening disorder, the overall size is potentially adequate. We had previously mentioned that most adverse events of MDMA were overall manageable, but concerns focused on MDMA's ability to significantly increase heart rate and systolic blood pressure. These two factors increase risk of myocardial infarction and illicit use of MDMA has indeed been associated with this issue and other serious events like central nervous system hemorrhage. Another open question is if MDMA causes arrhythmia, so irregular heartbeats, adding even more question marks. We've mentioned this when discussing ibogaine, which is known to prolong the QT interval of the heart, which can cause various issues, even days after initial use. QT studies for MDMA were deemed inadequate, which also isn't great. Another question mark was the lack of pre- and post-dose laboratory assessments such as liver function tests. This makes it challenging to identify early trends, for example for drug-induced liver injury, which is an adverse event of special interest for MDMA. Another example are EKG tests at discharge, which could be critical for the real-world setting where patient populations have many more comorbidities compared to the trial population. These lacking assessments were apparently simply missed, with the agency reviewer not noticing that lab tests were not part of the clinical study. Another missing point was that not enough data on neutral or positive adverse events was gathered, like patients feeling extremely happy or euphoric. This was advice previously provided by the FDA as they would help understand the well-known abuse potential of MDMA. It seems a bit strange that this was not done despite the request and again this is not optimal. To throw in some more controversy, at least one participant had reported an increase in suicidal ideation after the treatment session, but this did not show up in published results. Looks like my previous video is incorrect, given I even verbatim said that suicidal ideation only occurred for the placebo arm. Allegedly, staff did not appropriately recognize other severely negative outcomes. Some participants were told their negative experience was evidence of response, and such negative outcomes might have been excluded from the follow-up to manipulate or positively enrich the data. A last important safety consideration is that the trial also included down titration of other psychotropic medications prior to start of therapy. This can lead to worsening of conditions for some patients and was deemed inadequately assessed as well. Some final concerns on conduct included that some participants had been therapists themselves and or had close relations to study staff. Almost religious interests were supposedly prevalent and even instilled during the sessions. Again, MDMA's suggestibility becomes very important. So, upon closer inspection, quite a few potential weaknesses in the data and study execution. Unfortunately, this delays a potentially valuable option for patients for some additional years. You can make up your own mind if you think we should be better safe than sorry when going from 500 patients to potentially tens or hundreds of thousands. Prescription use would also require rescheduling of MDMA by the DEA and could increase illicit MDMA use. The risks are obvious, the benefit is promising but not fully clear, so a tough call to make. There's definitely more to talk about. 
there are more evolutions in PTSD and many wonder about the impact of this decision on other psychedelic agents. Maybe something for a future video. Did you learn something new today? Thank you for watching and thanks to everyone supporting my channel. As always, until next time.